well, welcome to uh, POC and Wednesday Academics. Uh, every second Wednesday, we do some topics for uh, which interest both budding and uh, established pediatricians. And the uh, topic for today is approach to neonatal encephalopathy. And uh, uh, we all know that uh, in earlier times, all neonatal encephalopathies were uh, termed as HIEs, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. But with the advent of good imaging and uh, with the genetic tests, we, are, we have been able to diversify our uh, diagnosis to a lot of things and many treatable uh, causes have also been found. To discuss this, uh, we have Dr. Prabhjot uh, from uh, Rainbow Hospital, Bangalore. And to moderate the session, uh, we have Dr. Shiv Sajan uh, Saini from uh, PGIM uh, MER Chandigarh. Uh, he uh, he did his uh, MBBS and uh, MD from Rothak uh, Medical College. And uh, presently, he is uh, Associate Professor of uh, Pediatrics in uh, Department of Neonatology, Division of Neonatology in PGI. He did his DM in Pediatric Neurology from the same institute, and he has got a lot of uh, publications and is academically very active. So, uh, Dr. Shiv, uh, please uh, take over the stage and uh, introduce uh, Dr. Prabhjot, and we'll start the session. Uh, thank you, Gurpreet. Thank you for the generous introduction. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, Dr. Prabhjot, who is Prabhjot Kaur, who is consultant pediatric uh, neurologist at uh, Rainbow Children Hospital, Bangalore. Uh, she has done her initial medical schooling and MD and DNB pediatrics from uh, Lady Harding Medical College, New Delhi. And thereafter, she did her DM in pediatric neurology from Ames, New Delhi. Uh, she is life member of uh, International Child Neurology Association and other several prominent uh, associations, including Indian Epilepsy Society. Uh, she has several publications and, edit, and uh, written many book chapters in, the, in this field. Her areas of interest include epilepsy, neuroimmunology, uh, uh, pediatric movement disorders. So uh, I would like to invite Dr. Prabhjot to deliver her talk uh, and uh, uh, discuss the important issues in neonatal encephalopathy. Over to you, Dr. Prabhu. Um, at the outset, I would like to thank um, AOCN for giving me this opportunity. And uh, thank you, Dr. Seni, for the kind introduction. With that, I would like to go ahead. So today I'll be discussing about approach to neonatal encephalopathy. Uh, so what I'll be discussing is neonatal encephalopathy. What are the definitions and the clinical conditions that uh, uh, what is basically the definition of neonatal encephalopathy and what all clinical conditions are covered under the, this scope of neonatal encephalopathy. The approach will be predominantly clinical, the role of investigations as well as management. So the clinical approach, investigations and management, I will try to keep it case-based so that uh, we uh, have a, a good hang of what is going on. So when we define neonatal encephalopathy, it has been classically defined as a clinical syndrome in early days of life, uh, predominantly applied to kids who are more than 35 weeks of gestational age, who present with disturbed neurological function, which uh, manifests as subnormal level of consciousness or seizures, and is often accompanied by difficulty with initiating and maintaining respiration, and often is associated with depression of tone and reflexes. So this definition was given in 2014. And uh, like we see, it, is, it says there's a subnormal level of consciousness. So this was considered to be a little vague uh, as consciousness may be difficult to define in newborns. So it was later modified uh, to include earliest days of life, which uh, is defined as uh, 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 the period of life up to the first 28 days of life for children who are born at or beyond 35 weeks of gestation and manifested by an abnormal level of alertness or seizures. And the rest of the features may be the same. <clears throat> Now, there are two things in this definition. One is that there's an emphasis on more than 35 weeks of gestation. Now, this kind of definition, both these definitions are predominantly used in research-based activities or epidemiological surveys. So more than 35 weeks of gestation, it is uh, easier to evaluate a newborn neurologically. Less than 35 weeks, owing to the developmental maturity of the newborns, it may sometimes be difficult to assess whether the examination is actually abnormal or not. But in case we go beyond this definition, for us, any child who is having uh, any abnormal level of alertness or is having seizures, accompanied by the respiratory difficulties, uh, depression of tone, 
we label it as a neonatal encephalopathy now neonatal encephalopathy includes various etiologies including hypoxia ischemia metabolic disturbances or infections now uh, very frequently neonatal encephalopathy has been used interchangeably it's interchangeably with uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy now um, neonatal encephalopathy is a broader term it and, and hi is a single entity which is a part of neonatal encephalopathy so in case we have a very clear cut uh, history to uh, support the diagnosis of hi or we have a very clear diagnosis which is uh, supported by imaging findings or history findings we term it as hie for today's discussion we will use neonatal encephalopathy for uh, the uh, new new forms with encephalopathy where we do not have a clear cut history of hie and where no definite diagnosis is known so a lot of etiologies um, are uh, there are a lot of etiologies which can result in neonatal encephalopathy hie being the commonest one in our country many acquired conditions like congenital and acquired infections like meningitis uh, intracranial hemorrhages ischemic or hemorrhagic strokes can result in uh, neonatal encephalopathy genetic syndromes isolated gene conditions neonatal epilepsy syndromes neurometabolic conditions can also result in neonatal encephalopathy now there are a group of pathologies which are known as double double pathologies why because these kids can present with neonatal encephalopathy but it may be secondary to weakness or neuromuscular disorders because of which the, the child is unable to breathe or and secondarily it results in a hypoxic ischemic event in the baby other than that lower down the line non accidental injuries can also result in cns injuries which can manifest as encephalopathy so before we go forward we'll just have a small case discussion so this was a 38 weeks baby uh, appropriate for gestational age Uh, birth weight was 3.1 kg. First born to a non-consanguinously married couple. There was no normal perinatal transition, and the baby was absolutely fine till day five of life. On day six of life, baby had respiratory distress, in view of which the baby was referred. So at the time of admission with us, the child had respiratory distress, had a weak cry, was flaccid. Uh, the alertness was less. There were less spontaneous movements. Respiratory efforts were poor, and for these things, the baby was ventilated. the baby also had shock requiring anotropic support so at this time of uh, presentation our differentials in will include late onset neonatal sepsis with shock with the possibility of associated meningitis or meningoencephalitis possible metabolic disorder because the child was absolutely well till day 5 of 5 of life but yes it comes lower down not up front so the initial labs showed a normal wbc count the platelets were low the sepsis screen was negative platelet was 1.5 lang chest x ray showed bilateral diffuse infiltrates the blood gas showed severe acidosis and it was a mixed acidosis with low bicarb and high pco2 liver functions as well as renal functions were normal csf was normal and because lower down a possibility of metabolic was kept so lactate and ammonia was sent and ammonia was high it was 32 millimoles per liter the baby also had hypoglycemia requiring a glucose infusion rate of 8 mg per kg per minute urine ketones were positive a uh, neurosonogram has showed cerebral edema and uh, at 24 hours the culture sensitivity of blood was showing a gram negative growth so uh, tms and gcms was sent so at this time we have uh, we have a definitive diagnosis that we have late onset neonatal sepsis with gram negative sepsis the baby is in shock maybe has pneumonia but with a high ammonia uh, uh, sorry baby has pneumonia with a high ammonia of 342 metabolic etiology is likely because the liver functions are also absolutely normal so we kept a metabolic me metabolic possible uh, possibility likely organic acid yes. so uh, a high ammonia of 342 warrants treatment so the baby was started on sodium benzoate and arginine hydroxycobalamin carnitine as well as thiamine and biotin but subsequently the metabolic acidosis continued to persist despite correction follow up ammonias were higher and at this ammonia PD, peritoneal dialysis was was initiated even after peritoneal dialysis the ammonia continued to rise and hemodialysis was then planned unfortunately at this time the family discontinued care and all this happened within 48 hours of admission of the baby so subsequently we did get follow up reports the tms as well as gcms were positive for propionic acidemia and genetics are still awaited so this is one of your typical non hie um, um, involved errors of metabolism 
now the important learning point is that these kids can have associated sepsis sepsis being one of the commonest associations with most other conditions and uh, the screening investigations when they show us something like a high ammonia level we need to start acting immediately as far as the treatment is concerned so how do we approach whenever we have such a child who comes to us with encephalopathy with no clear history of a prior insult so as any other uh, clinical case detailed history is important but what is more important in newborns is that we need to know need to have a very detailed antenatal perinatal history as well as a family history examination again is important and uh, laboratory investigations should be tiered investigations tailored to the uh, clinical scenario so um, the first thing that we need to know is a family history so ideally it is good to have a three generation family tree with focus on multiple miscarriages or still births in multiple family members childhood or childhood or early adult deaths a family history of cerebral palsy so whenever we get this history that somebody else in the family has a cerebral palsy it should immediately immediately alert us to the possibility of presence of certain other metabolic conditions or genetic conditions in the family because these may be certain like metabolic conditions neuromuscular conditions which are termed loosely as cerebral palsy learning difficulties uh, again can be a marker of metabolic disorders um, family members with seizures or encephalopathic episodes known metabolic conditions or early onset ischemic strokes need to be um, need to be delineated so we need to ask this history proactively and know in case in, in case any of these histories is present now in addition to that we need to know about the maternal past history in case the mother has had multiple miscarriages still births or neonatal deaths we need to consider genetic uh, disorders thrombophilic celiac disorders or metabolic disorders maternal diabetes can result in fetal thrombotic vasculopathy as well as postnatal hypoglycemia both of which can present with uh, in cephalopathy as well as seizures history of deep vein thrombosis or clotting disorders again can point towards uh, thrombophilia or clotting disorders or homocystinemia arterial ischemic strokes especially at young age can again uh, point out towards vascular abnormalities as well as clotting disorders uh, genetic disorders such as fall for inward mutation should be considered learning difficulties may may suggest a genetic or metabolic disorders family history of cerebral palsy like we discussed vascular abnormalities like call for a1 which can cause unilateral polyencephalic cysts or unilateral strokes uh, can present with hemiparetic cerebral palsies or even neuromuscular disorders need to be considered cataracts can uh, be present with iems myotonic dystrophies stiffness or stuttering can indicate myotonic disorders or hy hypereclepsia yeah um, maternal or family history of weakness or muscle fatigue uh can point towards neuromuscular problems uh distal weakness can point towards peripheral neuropathy and autoimmune disorders uh, uh sometimes will not get a history of as such an autoimmune disorder but we may get history of multiple endocrine abnormalities rashes skin abnormalities eye kidney abnormalities muscle pains heart blocks which may point towards an underlying autoimmune disorder and few of these autoimmune disorders can have a genetic predisposition or can pass on auto uh, auto antibodies to the newborn also then perinatal history of pregnancy or labor becomes very very important which is usually something that we do take in detail so any uh, um during pregnancy uh, the how are have the antenatal scans been have any anomalies been uh, detected on the antenatal ultrasound on the mris any multiple pregnancies especially um, multiple pregnancies at the uh, conception followed by fetal losses maternal infections carriage of group three streptococcus so carriage of group three streptococcus is not a routine practice which is being followed but some centers may have this practice history of maternal hypertension pre eclampsia or eclampsia again can point towards peri um, um, kind of a chronic fetal hypoxia any use of uh, maternal prescribed as well as illicit drugs is important to know any illnesses during pregnancy uh, maternal help syndrome in case it is associated with induced fatty infiltration may indicate a lcat deficiency or long um, uh, 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 long chain hydroxyacide uh, dehydrogenase deficiency again gestational diabetes can be predisposed to postnatal hypoglycemia any traumas to the mother accidental falls road traffic accidents or assaults especially in the perinatal period can result in a uh, compromise of the fetal vascular um, uh, fetal blood flow can again result in ischemia and encephalopathy 
any acute perinatal events is uh, is anyways a very strong indicator that it can result in encephalopathy maternal hypotension or evidence of maternal hemorrhage uh, again is important to know non accidental injuries of babies if presenting following a normal period of consciousness they should be considered so if a baby has been absolutely normal nothing major to suggest a major illness or encephalopathy and all of a sudden we have a baby who is presenting with encephalopathy non accidental injuries can be considered examination of the parents again is important for majorly for neuromuscular disorders especially for mothers and maternal myotonia should always be checked uh, whenever we have a child who presents with neonatal weakness examination of the newborn again uh, again a detailed head to head to toe examination of the baby looking at the head circumference abnormalities dysmorphism abnormal fontanelle shape or size any rashes which may be suggestive of immune or metabolic conditions or bleeding disorders clotting disorders any weakness involving the um, internal or external um, eye muscles facial weakness proximal or distal weakness any features of uh, spinal involvement should also be looked for especially after difficult vaginal birth uh, in which we may get mixed upper and lower motor neuron findings bladder retention or constipation so there are few features which can suggest a metabolic condition such as dysmorphism micro macrocephaly liver involvement with hepatomegaly or waste uh, enzymes cardiac involvement uh, with cardiomyopathy or heart failure i have normality such as retinitis pigmentosa cataracts chai red spot uh, optic atrophy lens dislocation so these are few things that we will actively look for once we are suspecting a metabolic condition fetal high drops yes lower down the line uh, after a lot of the common etiologies have been ruled out may be a feature of a metabolic condition so how do we approach whenever we have a child with neonatal encephalopathy we review history and examination we get, if we get a very clear cut history which is consistent with hi we manage it accordingly we may consider investigations like eeg amputated integrated eeg neuro imaging and uh, management according to the uh, neonatology protocols in case we are not getting a specific history so first line investigations become important we do your our, our routine investigations like hemogram clotting uh, studies liver and renal functions infection markers csf glucose so these first three things are very very important because they kind of give us an idea in case we are dealing with a sepsis or uh, infection in the baby and this is one of the commonest etiologies in our centers in addition to hi which can result in neonatal encephalopathy cns infections serum ammonia lactate blood gas urine ketones can be considered as a first line investigation in case we have a very high suspicion of a metabolic disorder and the availability is not a issue once we are through these investigations we get a few clues we can plan for a second line investigations which again may include ammonia lactate and basic metabolic workup work depending upon the availability and the clinical scenario other than that neuro imaging uh, preferably an mri but as we all know mri may not be a feasible first line investigation so neuro sonogram gives us a fair fair idea but um, as as a bed, bedside investigation but mri is preferable once the baby is stable other than that our uh, metabolic workups including but not limited to tms and gcms echocardiography in case it is indicated so common causes of neonatal encephalopathy include sepsis which we will diagnose on the basis of, uh, of our x rays screens cultures low hb and intracranial hemorrhage we can diagnose on neurosonogram in case we have a child with raised icp features so we do need to consider meningoencephalitis large uh, intracranial hemorrhages large infarcts and congenital tumors and we may need to consider early neurosurgery intervention so usually uh, normally acute in, acute um, ischemic strokes or infarcts do not present with raised icp large infarcts however can present with a raised icp and it can present with considerable encephalopathy in case we have a baby who has hypotonia or contractures in addition to encephalopathy we consider other pathologies like neuromuscular disorders or very high cervical trauma in case in which case the baby may be having a weakness but uh, can have preserved reflexes and we can plan for a cpk or a emg investigate accordingly plan for an mri of this mri of this pain if we have initial investigations consistent with iem we will discuss it further in epilepsy predominant phenotypes we consider the uh, differentials of vitamin responsive epilepsies structural brain abnormalities uh, neonatal um, non ketotic hyperglycemia 
glut one deficiency sulfite oxidase molybdenum cofactor deficiencies paroxysmal disorders so again they can have a lot of encephalopathy in addition to epilepsy other disorders we may consider our structural brain step abnormalities which may be associated with poor respiratory drive and a secondary uh, dullness or decreased alertness of the baby uh, congenital lung diseases cardiac diseases may also be result may also be associated with a poor dull or lethargic baby so in case we have screening investigations which include our basic testing like hypoglycemia using ketones ammonia lactate uh, which are elevated or abnormal on acidosis which point towards an iem then we can follow a common approach so in case we have metabolic acidosis which is not explained by associated sepsis hypoxia um, bowel ischemia gut issues dehydration or poor perfusion then we look at how are the lactates and ammonia so we have an elevated lactate especially with high ammonia we consider organic acidosis elevated lactate in its own may be may be present in mitochondrial disorders associated with persistent hypoglycemia we should consider fatty acid oxidation disorders organic acidemias tsds so these are the disorders in which the energy metabolism is affected which is also secondary results in elevated lactate in case we have metabolic acidosis with normal lactate again we consider organic acidemias which may or may not be elevated with be associated with elevated ammonia in case with um, uh, elevated lactates or organic acid profiles is normal we need to consider mitochondrial disorders like pyruvic dehydrogenase deficiency pyruvic decarboxylase deficiency respiratory chain defects in case there is no metabolic acidosis or it resolves quickly uh then we look at other parameters is the baby having persistent hypoglycemia if associated with persistent hypoglycemia the ketones are low and free fatty acids are raised we consider the differentials of fatty acid oxidation disorders or carnitine pathway defects in case both of these are low it indicates a state with increase insulin elevated ammonia with a uh, normal blood gas no acidosis it is predominantly the urea cycle defects that we consider in case of normal sugars no hypoglycemia and ammonia there can be a set of other genetic disorders that we can consider some of which include paroxysmal disorders which will have clinical clues like dysmorphism skeletal abnormalities uh, hepatomegaly cataracts retinitis pigmentosa glycosylation disorders again uncommon but can have uh, a floppy weak baby can have infer- inverted nipples abnormal fat pads and transfin transfin like isoelectric focusing may be uh, helpful so this is kind of a very basic approach and many times we will not identify any etiology once we have through this investigations or once we have done screening investigations so in these cases we can consider genetic epilepsy syndromes in case in cases we have refractory epilepsy or epilepsy predominant phenotypes it can be an unknown iem it can be single gene syndromes or uh, syndromic disorders and it can also be atypical presentation of hiv depending upon the clinical scenario we can and we should try to get a genetic testing whenever it is feasible so going beyond this we'll be discussing a few cases to try to assimilate whatever we have kind of gone through in the previous slides so uh, this baby was a 10 day old girl child and a um, previously well baby and presented with multiple episodes of abnormal posturing cyclical movements of the limbs and arching of the back so this was a 39 week old uh, baby born at a um, um, birth weight of 2.9 kg tried immediately after birth with good apgar scores had a normal perinatal transition good feeding normal antenatal history and born to non consanguinously married couple so prior to referral this baby was treated as a um, uh, neonatal seizures received levipil up to 40 clonobarbitone up to 3 mg per kg per day and because of persisting seizures posturing was referred prior to referral the normal uh, normal ptinr and factor sa had been documented so uh, uh, family history wise there was no previous abortion or inter uterine deaths but maternal grandmother had varicose veins pulmonary embolism history was present maternal si- maternal sister had significant postpartum hemorrhage requiring multiple blood transfusions so when this bab- baby was admitted the baby had altered mental status with no spontaneous eye opening poor pain responses had intermittent cycling movements uh, posturing of the entire body arching of the back the af was full the pulsations were poor p 
pupils were bilaterally equal and reactive to light. Tone was decreased in all the four limbs and had exaggerated reflexes. So one thing was clear that it is definitely there are signs of the excitity. Most possibility, or most likely possibility being an intracranial hemorrhage with an underlying etiology to be investigated. So this baby, uh, when presented, had did not have any uh, poor respiratory efforts, but was still intubated and put on uh, ventilation as a part of neuroprotection, started on various ICP measures, uh, started on anti-seizure medicines. In view of um, anti-seizure medicines, um, bedside neurosonogram revealed a large bleed which was occupying both the lateral ventricles as well as the, uh, the, the third ventricle. So CT subsequently was done, a contrast enhanced CT, which showed a grade three IVH, which was occupying the lateral third as well as the fourth ventricles. There were signs of the hydrocephalus. And the main reason for CECT was to look for any signs of CSVT, which was not present. EEG done, he showed near continuous discharge as sickle runs, which was right temporal predominant, and there was no normal background. So in QVN view of persisting seizures, the child was started on midazolam infusion with continuous EEG monitoring. Anti-seizure medicines were optimized and the baby was, was continued on mechanical ventilation. Over 36 hours, the ictal discharges gradually decreased. Normal activity started appearing. And by day four, he had a normal background activity with few epileptiform discharges. So by day eight, we were able to taper off phenobarbitone and phenytoin. Nevibil was continued. And by day 18, the baby was on room care. So this baby, once we could do an MRI, there was a large bleed in the uh, right uh, lateral ventricle uh, extending into all the four horns. It also involved the uh, third ventricle as well as the fourth ventricle extended down till that. And diffusion imaging did show diffusion restriction in the sclenium and few areas of the a few periventricular, uh, right-sided periventricular areas. We did an MRA and as we can see only part of the um, the entire uh, arterial system of the baby is visible, which was normal, but a very large part of it is obscured by a bleed. So ideally an MRA should be done after six weeks of an acute bleed because uh, it tends to obscure the MRA and the, the arterial system like this. So subsequently this baby was extensively worked up for bleeding etiologies, everything was negative. Genetics is still pending, we have still not planned for genetic testing. So the final diagnosis was a neonatal hemorrhagic stroke. So this case shows that how a brain hemorrhage can present with significant encephalopathy, which requires uh, a good aggressive management for uh, control of the raised intracranial pressure and for neuroprotection. So moving on to the next case. So this was again a term baby, 39 weeks, 3.1 kg, was a AGA baby and had a vacuum assisted victory. History wise, the baby had cried immediately after birth and APCA scores were not available. The baby was born out of a non consenting miscarriage. Normal antenatal period, normal family history. Immediately after birth, the baby had respiratory distress, required NICU care and oxygen support for three days. The baby had culture negative sepsis with a positive screen and low platelet counts. Now, the reason for concern was the baby had persistent lethargy even till day of life five. So the baby was being managed, possibly sepsis. Now on day of five life, the baby had two episodes of left focal seizures for which the baby was loaded with levitin and then was given phenobarbitone and subsequently was referred in view of both seizures as well as persistent lethargy. So at the time of admission, the baby was tachypneic, had a poor cry, tone and activity, suggesting encephalopathy. All newborn reflexes were um, depressed and the right parietal cephal hematoma was present. So at this point, the differentials included sepsis or meningitis. We did keep a possibility of intracranial hemorrhage because it was a vacuum delivery. And there was a, outside we had a evidence of a right variety of hematoma. Lower down with focal seizures, neonatal stroke, uh, hemorrhagic or acute systemic stroke was being considered. So this baby was put on an HFNC oxygen support. Chest X-ray was normal. The baby had a third seizure, required again level increasing up to 40, after which the seizures were okay. CSF was fine, then the screen, sepsis screen was normal, cultures were normal. EEG was showing right frontal discharges. Sonogram was normal, newborn screening was normal. Screening ammonia and lactate was also normal. Blood culture did grow clepsial and pneumonia. So by day three of admission, the sensorium was better. So at this time, the thought process was probably the baby had uh, clepsial sepsis and that is why probably we had um, neonatal seizures and lethargy. And culture sensitivity came out to be negative as the baby was 
uh, the CSF was normal as the baby was on antibiotics. So we, uh, by day three, since OEM was better, the cry and activity improved, neonatal reflexes improved, and we did get an MRI done to look for any, um, to, to, to complete the investigation workup. And also because the child had undergone a vacuum delivery. So surprisingly on the MRI, we found that the baby had, so these are the diffusion images. So what we see here is that the sclenium of the corpus callosum, the posterior periventricular regions and bilateral posterior thalami show diffusion restriction. And if we go up into the higher uh, images, we see that a, a watershed area kind of diffusion restriction suggestive of watershed infarcts is present. So we had watershed area infarcts with thalamic diffusion restrictions, which is actually consistent with mild to moderate hysteria. So probably the vacuum during the vacuum assisted delivery, which would have happened because the baby, because it was a difficult sleeper, the baby would have undergone mild to moderate hysteria. And again, it is a little uncommon for the baby to have seizures because of, because of um, uh, mild to moderate hysteria, let's say stage two by day five, but the baby persisted to be in keptopathic till day five, had a seizure, subsequently improved. So final diagnosis we had was an HA stage two with cultures, neonatal seizures and culture positive sepsis. So the baby in case at, at present, no further investigations are planned. In case the baby shows any, few, any new features, we will see in follow-up. So uh, again, in this case, what it teaches us is that neuroimaging does help. So once we have a neuroimaging pattern, which is very typical of a mild to moderate ischemia, we kind of would want to follow up, follow up the child rather than going in for a lot of other investigations to find out that what is the cause of neonatal seizures for this child. So uh, going on to the next case, so this was a preterm baby, 35 weeks gestational age, appropriate for gestation, uh, had meconium aspiration at birth, had respiratory distress requiring CPAP, and at 36 hours of life, had seizures, required levipil and phenobarbitone, and was seizure-free for the next seven days. So was managed with HIE with neonatal seizures, managed as HIE with neonatal seizures. And over the next seven days, baby improved, also off respiratory support, direct, direct breastfeedings were initiated. Activity was good and baby was subsequently discharged. Now this baby comes back on day of like 15 with recurrent seizures, uh, uh, three to four episodes. And the baby was, uh, in the levy pill, which was already on wing was increased. Clinical seizures were controlled, but the baby continued to have poor activity, decreased spontaneous body movements, poor feeding, and subsequently we received this baby on a uh, day of life 80 in view of worsening and capacity. So at the time of admission, the baby had a rate of uh, 60 per minute, was hemodynamically stable, blood pressures were okay, good efforts, but the cry, tone, and neonatal reflexes were depressed, and the sucking was poor. So we have a late preterm baby with meconium aspiration, respiratory distress, neonatal seizures, initially which were consistent with HIE stage 2 and now has had recurrent seizures on day 15 of life. So the differential considered again, was it HIE related seizures? Is it late onset neonatal sepsis or meningitis? Again, again, sepsis is one of the foremost differentials we consider. One, because it is something which is very, very common. Second thing, in case we miss it, we all know that neonates will not give us much time to salvage it later on. So we, and it, and it is something which is treatable. So we want to rule it out, diagnose it early and start treatment early. Was it a secondary uh, structural insult to the brain due to the initial HIE, lower down metabolic etiology, vitamin responsive epilepsies or genetic epilepsies really lower down were being considered at this point of time. So uh, the plan was to do an infection worker, do an EEG, neuroimaging and plan further worker, a metabolic, versus genetic. Once we have a neuroimaging, we are in the clear whether we are looking at HIE or not. So the baby was put on NG tube feed, feeds because the baby was having a poor suck. Had some uh, uh, CPAP was put because after admission, the baby had some respiratory distress. No, like, and, but subsequently the baby had recurrence of seizures 24 hours after admission. So after this recurrence of seizures, the baby's sensorium really uh, decreased. There was a poor respiratory uh, drive and the baby had to be mechanically ventilated. So uh, the labs uh, on the, uh, at this time showed a normal sepsis screen, normal platelet found in hemogram. Chest X-ray at this time showed RDS with bilateral diffuse infiltrates. ABG was normal, liver and renal functions were normal. CSF was normal. Neurosonogram showed mild cerebral edema, but the EEG, um, was it having an encephalopathic background. So this EEG, as we can see for this, uh, this is a 36-weeker baby at day of life 18, 
showing interburst interval of almost uh, eight to nine, around ten to interburst interval of ten to twelve seconds, which is pretty long, as well as the bursts which were abnormal were showing spike rate discharges. Uh, and the IBI amplitude was less than ten. So this is consistent with the burst suppression pattern. Uh, and the burst. Excuse me, Dr. Gupta. Uh, yes, sir. If you, could, uh, if you could point it out on the. Uh, okay. While you are showing, so, so that. So uh, this is a compressed view of the EEG. So it is a. Uh, so this one section shows one second. So we have this one epoch of the EEG. So these are the areas of the bursts. This is a burst of activity, and this is an interburst interval. So less than 44 weeks of age, we expect the EEG to be discontinuous, which means that the EEG will have areas of bursts, which are the activity areas. And in between the bursts, we will have suppressed areas, which are known as interburst intervals. So normally, the, uh, by this age, we should expect that the, um, the interburst intervals should have an amplitude, which, is, which should be more than 25. So for this baby, it was less than 10, which is suppressed. And if you look at the activity of the burst, so there is the morphology of the activity, which was abnormal, as well as if we look at the amplitude, the amplitude difference between the burst activity and the interburst activities, the difference is more than 50%, more than 50%. So this is abnormal for this age. So if you look at age-related EEGs, it shows an abnormal EEG, which is encephalopathic. And if you look at the bursts of activity, we see that there are discharges, epileptiform discharges, but we do not see um, ictal runs. So this was an EEG which was consistent with an encephalopathic EEG. So we had a burst suppression pattern. We had epilepsy plus encephalopathy for a baby after 15, 15 days after birth with negative sepsis markers. So we went ahead with uh, the metabolic screening. The sugars, ammonia, lactate was normal. We gave IV pyridoxine with the EEG monitoring, but we did not see any significant immediate changes in the EEG, which usually we do expect in case it is a pyridoxine dependent epilepsy. We sent for TMS and GCMS. We started the child on pyridoxine and folinic acid, considering it might be a vitamin responsive epilepsy. So once we start IV pyridoxine, it is now preferable to continue pyridoxine for another five days. We also started on hydroxycobalamin and thiamine as an empirical treatment for metabolic, few metabolic conditions, which may be responsive to this. So further workup MRI brain with MRS was normal, TMS as well as GCMS was normal. And uh, beyond this, after five days, the baby started improving. So after five days, when we did the EEG, now if we compare this EEG to the previous EEG, we see a lot of normal activity going on in these areas. So the, um, the interburst interval started showing normal activities, the amplitudes improved, as well as the bursts that we, which we, we were seeing earlier were more abnormal, have started evolving towards a more normal pattern. And, um, and even the state related changes. So we had areas which were becoming continuous and states areas which are discontinuous. So this is somewhat of a normal EEG for this age as compared to the previous EEG, which was very abnormal. So by this time, that is another five days down the line, uh, baby had started improving. Sensorium was improving. There was no seizure recurrence in the next two weeks. Gradually, we were able to put the baby on paladite feeds, but baby did require prolonged respiratory support even after extubation. And um, by the time we could discharge the baby, which was another two, uh, two to three weeks, the baby had a normal neurological examination at discharge. Genetic report is still pending. So this baby was discharged around two weeks back only. So this case, what it shows is that now we have a baby who has a, has a history of HIE, but the MRI and MRS, MRI does not clinically correlate. History does not very much clearly, clinically correlate with HIE-related seizures presenting after day 15 offline. And even after the extensive uh, first and second line investigations, we do not have a very clear etiology as to what could be underlying. So by the time we had discharged the baby, we uh, kept the possibility of it being a likely genetic epilepsy and keplopathic syndrome. It may be vitamin responsive epilepsy, maybe metabolic epilepsy. Now, what worked for this child, we do not know whether it was the uh, vitamin responsive epilepsy, vitamins we started, it may have worked. But it is highly likely that whatever underlying genetic syndrome the baby is having, it might have a course in which it spontaneously improves with time. So, once we have a genetic diagnosis, it will give us a better idea. So, it just exemplifies that even with all the in extensive investigations, we may not always reach a diagnosis 
or a uh, or a um, provisional diagnosis by the end of our evaluation. So something that we have learned in all these three cases is something about the management. So supportive management is very, very important. So at the onset, even if we don't know what is the etiology, what are we looking at? Neuroprotective measures are very important. Good aggressive management of intracranial, least intracranial pressure, management of seizures is important. And something beyond the pure neurological phenotypes. There has to be an aggressive control for associated sepsis, shock, gut issues, hypoglycemia, because they all lead to added morbidity and mortality in the short term, as well as long-term morbidities. So supportive care is the most important part in the management of these babies. So second thing, treatable etiologies always take a precedence. So in our country, in our setting, sepsis is very, very common. Sepsis can coexist with anything else. And we do, we do grow a lot of organisms in most of the kids who, who are outbound in our NICO. Third thing, neuroimaging neuro is important. If after the first 10 uh, investigations, we, um, we uh, after the first 10 investigations, neuroimaging can give us very important handles, such as HIE, CNS infections, such as viral infections or congenital infections, um, venous thrombosis, intracranial hemorrhages or strokes, certain metabolic diseases like mitochondrial uh, disorders, um, um, paroxysmal disorders, organic acidurias, and even structural abnormalities, which may be associated with epilepsy or certain metabolic disorders, they can be diagnosed or they, they can be provisionally very reliably or they give us very important clues as to what is happening. So neuroimaging is very, very important in the management. Third thing, the screening investigations do guide management. So the initial screening investigations, if we get things like hyponomonemia, hypoglycemia, we can start specific treatments for them. Empirical megadose vitamins may help in management like hydroxycobalamin, thiamine, biotin, carnishol, or vitamin which is responsive epilepsies because many of these metabolic disorders may respond to one or more of these vitamins. So to wind up, so this is the last case. So this was again a 36 weeks appropriate for gestation age baby, had an apparently normal transition and on day of life two had presented with multiple episodes of seizures, received two days doses of Levitil was continued to be very dull, poorly responsive, and had shallow efforts post the seizures, um, with ongoing seizures, and uh, was mechanically ventilated for the same, and was suffered. So by the time the baby was admitted with us, the baby had respiratory distress, had, uh, had the desaturation, sugars were normal, the baby was having a poor cry and pain response. So the differentials considered at this point were probably it is metabolic, uh, usual metabolic calcium magnesium deficiency, RBS, um, hypoglycemia related. This is a preterm baby. Early onset neonatal sepsis or meningitis. Third lower down, IEM was considered. So when the X-ray was done for this baby, because he was mechanically ventilated, there was a right-sided pneumothorax. So initial investigations were normal except for the low calcium. Chest X-ray showed a light right pneumothorax. Sepsis screen was negative, CSF was normal, EEG was normal for age. So what this baby had was hypocalcemic seizures, uh, multiple hypocalcemic seizures. And within 20, uh, once the calcium was collected, the baby was ex the baby did not have any further seizures. 24 hours at the admission, the baby was extubated since it was wetter, no seizures occurrence. Culture reports are still awaited. So the diagnosis for this baby was hypocalcemic seizures. As the baby is predisposed, this is a preterm baby, also had pneumothorax and probably associated hypoxia. So the lesson from this case is that not every neonatal encephalopathy, not every neonatal seizure is sinister. Common things are still common. So we have to rule out common things like low sugars, low calcium, magnesium correction. They all have to be done before we go on to other extensive investigations. So to wrap up, my take home messages would be that uh, first thing is that not all neonatal encephalopathies are hypoxic ischemic encephalopathies. Whenever we do not have a clear history or we have a period in which the baby has been absolutely normal, then deteriorates, we should investigate. We should use our investigations very judicially, tailor it according to our patients. Beyond the first line investigations, neuroimaging gives us very important handles. It is a, a, a very, very useful investigation. Management-wise, supportive care is the backbone for uh, good outcomes for these babies. And we should try to establish diagnosis in all cases, but it may not always be possible. So that will be all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Prashbo. Uh, 
for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, discussion and interesting, very interesting uh, collection of cases which you have presented. Uh, the um, uh, and you have uh, very nicely taken us through the detailed uh, scheme of uh, you know in uh, the evaluation and management of the cases of insect, uh, neonatal insectivity. So one thing is uh, very clear that uh, the differential diagnosis of neonatal encephalopathy is very broad. Maybe it may start from a simple so-called wastebasket diagnosis of sepsis, but it can lead to metabolic, it can lead to traumatic, it can lead to bleeds, etc., and all the way to genetic things, uh, much more complex than we can understand. Probably many of them are not even you know uh, beyond the uh, knowledge of uh, human beings. So basically. Uh, uh, so we should uh, try to tackle this in a schematic way, and this starts as a, uh, with the adequate history taking, uh, doing a you know detailed neurological examination, overall head to toe examination, and then summarizing all the uh, information by history and examination, which will give us clues to the uh, to the which way to uh, you know make our first line, second line, and third line investigations, because the investigative panel will be too broad. And it, it will be not be possible to do all investigations in a given yes. We need to make them, you know, a stepwise approach to do investigation in our history and, ex and examination and clues, uh, which you have nicely explained in various cases. They will they give us, you know, point us towards what should be our line of uh, investigations. Uh, sepsis, you have rightly, uh, uh, told that sepsis is a waste basket diagnosis and many times it will actually mask the underlying disorder especially the you know metabolic disorders they can be masked uh, uh, when you have uh, when we have some marker of sepsis which may be uh, you know uh, acquired and sepsis it is it's important to recognize the sepsis may be acquired later on uh, down the line once the baby is you know coming from uh, various uh, hospitals and by the time reach you or even in your hospital it can be complicated by the you know course during the course so uh, uh, very uh, uh, very nice uh, summary of cases i would i would like to uh, uh, rather ask about uh, and what what could be the reason of the you know biphasic kind of a uh, you know disorder seizure disorder in a 35 week case 3 it was very interesting uh, that baby had seizures on preterm 35 week or baby had seizures on day five of life, then had uh, recurrence of seizures and you showed the EEG, which was quite abnormal on day 18 of life, uh, which was showed, uh, which showed uh, by the time the baby was corrected age of almost 38 to 39 weeks and had got a very long interburst interval of uh, almost 10 to 12 seconds, recovered in seven to 10 days old, uh, seven to 10 days later. So, to be it, honest, that was also a difficult case for us because initially when the baby presented, so uh, initial thoughts were like we were discussing it was sepsis, so our Niku was managing. And uh, because the baby had undergone that episode of HIE also, so the reptile was also late considering that it is all possibly HIE and sepsis related. So only once the baby had a recurrence of seizures after coming to the hospital and deteriorated, that is when we started investigating that okay, it is something else. Then too, it was the EEG, which was very, very abnormal for a baby who would be having only sepsis or meningitis or HIE. That kind of, uh, you know, we accelerated our uh, investigative workup. But sir, we really don't know what is the diagnosis. Yeah. So this baby was discharged some two weeks back, is yet to come for the first follow-up. So probably in a month or so, we should have something to, you know, we are all very curious to know what it is. So many times, uh, you know, they, what were even more interesting was that the EEG kind of uh, normalized. Not kind of normalized. Within, within 10 days after yes, after so much abnormal, you know, once we have burst suppression pattern on EEG, show it is very sinister and uh, you know, gives us uh, a bad, kind of a, usually a bad prognostic. So with this, uh, I would like to uh, ask everybody if uh, someone wants to ask questions, they can put on yeah. the... There are a few questions, I think. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's start with that same case. Case three, uh, somebody has asked at what day MRI was done and uh, till how many days can we expect diffusion changes after the insult? So, sir, for this baby, the MRI was done around 24, 25 days of life. So this case three is the same seizure case. So 
Yeah. So for this baby, we had done a late temporizer. Diffusion changes are uh, usually by the second week beyond day seven or ten, the diffusion stages will normalize. The ideal time for HIV related uh, um, um, MRI would be around day seven to day ten. or beyond because before that the exact extent of the injury is not very clear that is what is said but in case we want to know what is the timing of injury and the early mri can be done between 48 to 92 hours single time mri it is best to do beyond day 7 of life yeah i think uh, it is it is very important uh, what probably they want to know about the diffusion uh, weighted images uh, what is the ideal time i am not sure Uh, whether they want to ask this or not, but there is something known as pseudo normalization, which may happen on uh, day three to day five. So yes, basically, if you want to uh, do a diffusion restriction, I mean diffusion weighted MRI, uh, generally it is the uh, after therapeutic hypothermia, the baby is undergoing therapeutic hypothermia in context of basically birth asphyxia. I'm, I'm telling you, in context of that it can be. Roughly close to day four, day five, and in uh, non-hypoxic ischemic cases, uh, as you have said. Yeah. So uh, there are two questions about anti-edema measures in newborn. So uh, does uh, anti-edema measure is it required in newborn for raised ICP as anterior fontanelle is open? And similarly, another question is for neonates: is three percent saline or mannitol recommended? So what's your take? So as such. Uh... Uh, as such, uh, like it is a classical teaching that uh, open AF, we should not. It should not be required. New surgical intervention is also not required. So, but sometimes we do end up with cases who have bad bleeds. There is large shift, and uh, the resistive indexes are very high. In those cases, we can give a trial of three percent saline. We haven't tried mannitol. Evidence as such is not very clear on that. Um, so, so one or two cases it has helped. Especially beyond neonatal neonatal age, two to three months, we have definitely seen that it does help. And uh, as a unit protocol in our PICU, especially kids between two to three months, anti-edema measures are used. But if you will ask me about evidence, there is no strong evidence to support it. Okay, Doctor Sajan, any uh, experience uh, you or your NICU in PGI? Do you use uh, mannitol or three uh, percent any time in HI or non-HI raised ICPs? Yes. So mannitol, mannitol, and uh, three, they, these are not used because, as uh, rightly pointed out by Doctor Patel, it is usually it is not required. Uh, okay. But once, once in a odd case, you can have uh, you know generally the open air, open AF that that does not allow the raised ICP to raise to to you know to increase uh, that much. But there are no actually studies uh, to uh, choose which one to use. uh it de- also also depends upon the sodium level so in odd case uh, you are free to use in the given case i mean uh the underlying reason could be bleed then you you have to uh you know uh, choose whether the baby requires surgical intervention if there is large shift or not if there is sepsis it is better sepsis management but uh, in in case you have a very uh you know brain stem is is uh, there is a uh, So it's compression instant, and you can you are free to use. Maybe you can use three percent, three percent saline. We have also ended up using only in bleeds. So mm-hmm. neonatal case, this was the only case where we have actually used it at any time between two to three months. Very large bleeds, large mm-hmm. midline shifts, we have used. Other than that, with the um, uh, infections and not, we usually don't. So there is no robust evidence of these. No robust evidence. Yes. So uh, another question is, how do we check for Group B streptococcus carriage in mother? Please, which test is used for that? So I think it is something which is not practiced in our country. It is practiced in outside countries, but many mm-hmm. places they will do major maternal swabs and uh, send for uh, uh, screening in this culture. Yes. Sir. Okay. Okay. So only is it in India. Uh, yeah dr anchuman verma has asked is it advisable to do the first line uh, iem workup like ammonia lactate and abg when the baby presents with encephalopathy and sepsis won't the ammonia be falsely elevated in uh, sepsis uh, acidosis is also common so how will you differentiate so so ammonia to be elevated only in sepsis without liver involvement is unlikely and as such in case we have any um, history or clinical features like the course is something which is we are not able to fit into a single diagnosis then we can send a screening investigation 
otherwise in case we have got strong positive sepsis markers uh, then probably as a screening investigation we do not need to send mm -hmm. and uh, acidosis correctly pointed out can be especially metabolic acidosis respiratory acidosis can be seen due to other reasons also but hyperammonemia that too once it is crossing somewhere like more than 100 that is something that we will not usually see outside of liver failure or significant liver injuries so hyperammonemia we should be very careful with if we are getting high values we should definitely investigate as well as treat so immediately we should start treating yeah many a time uh, sepsis and iems both coexist and definitely it's important to do ammonia and abg because the severity of ammonia levels uh, in hyperammonemia points out towards iem and severity of acidosis also sometimes it's out of proportion so i think it is important okay so Dr. Mini is thanking you for the comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, how will you see HSV2 encephalitis and paricovirus infection? And uh, do you get IV benzoate at your hospital? Okay. So HSV2, I haven't actually seen any little HSV2, sir. So as, as far as we know, it is a very severe encephalopathy. Paricovirus, so yes, it presents with neonatal encephalopathy. MRI changes are something that we are, that are kind of kind of a pattern that we know is associated with the neonatal paricoviruses. So usually a lot of uh, white matter diffusion restriction is something that we see in paricovirus uh, infections. IV sodium benzoate, no, we do not get. And it is very difficult to arrange even oral sodium benzoate. So I think that is a problem probably all of us face. Yeah. Herpes simplex, we do see um, off and on, we do see neonates with herpes encephalitis. Also, paricovirus clusters or paricovirus-like illnesses. I mean, we are not able to prove many a times. Many a times they are dengue or even rotavirus infections. Uh, usually, PCRs, they are not very commonly and freely available. So, we miss a lot of time. And yes, IV is not available. And cost is also effective for PCRs. Yeah. PCRs. So, uh, Dr. Pratima has asked for peroxisomal and uh, lysosomal disorders apart from genetics. What screening test do you recommend? Um, we can do very long chain fatty acid levels for peroxisomal disorders, but then again, availability is an issue. Lysosomal disorders, again, levels of uh, uh, certain metabolites can be done, but then availability is in a very select uh, centers and cost is also a factor. So in case there is an availability, the finances are not an issue, you can send it outside. It is a good, I mean, we can go ahead and do it. I think fundus also may help in some lysosomal disorders. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. So, Dr. Sangeeta is uh, congratulating again for excellent presentation. Can neuroimaging finding in case 3 uh, suggestive of paricovirus, I mean, diffuse uh, the, the white matter diffusion restriction? Um, okay. I don't know. Doesn't yes. look like it was predominantly posterior dominant. The baby improved uh, significantly within a few days. In fact, very short admission, the baby improved well. And very, uh, this uh, parasitical kind of a pattern of illness, when they coupled with this uh, vacuum-assisted delivery, which uh, probably was because of an obstructed labor, some amount of hypoxia we can expect. But like Mam has pointed out, it is not 100% that we can rule it out. It is something that we can just, uh, you know, hypothesize. Many a times, uh, this uh, paricovirus, they, on the follow-up, we see spastic diplegia. So yes, when sir. we see a term or near-term baby with spastic diplegia and uh, not able to find any cause because mm. metabolics and all, they all be novel. So this is one of the cause because earlier MRIs were not done. Now yes, we are sir. picking them more and more. More and more. That is right. Sir. It could be. Yeah. Yeah. So what serum ammonia level is considered normal for a term and a preterm uh, units? Yeah. So that is a tricky question. Probably I can tell but when to intervene. Uh, so see, normal ammonias we usually don't see a lot. So then we screening also somewhere around 40, 50 probably is normal. Something beyond 100, yes, we will definitely investigate. But uh, I am not able to quote an exact reference. Ajahn, any comment? Uh, yeah, yeah. So basically the serum ammonia levels, usually 50 to 150, they are uh, kind of a borderline more than more than uh, 150, they are abnormal. And uh, in the metabolic conditions, usually, the two most common metabolic conditions which have very high serum ammonia, urea cycle disorders, and uh, you know organic acidemias, they do present like uh, uh, 
toxic encephalopathy is baby is usually normal in first few days, uh, first two to three days, and then the baby presents with severe encephalopathy. So that kind, that's kind of a presentation. One presents with uricycle disorders, present with uh, respiratory alkalosis and uh, organic acidemias, they present with metabolic uh, acidosis. So basically, this is the, uh, and in those cases, the uh, ammonia levels usually cross 500. So once we have uh, 300, 500, 1000 values, they are more suggestive of uh, metabolic disorders. Uh, lesser values, they may, you know, they may have uh, either metabolic or infective. Uh, as rightly pointed out by Dr. Prabhjot, usually the lower values nearing 100, they, they may be there in sepsis, but in sepsis of setting, if the liver failure is there, then the values can be a little higher also. So, but if you want to me to have a one cutoff, it may be 300, maybe. More than that is maybe metabolic. Dr. Kavita has just pointed out and uh, rightly that sodium benzoate we get as preservatives uh, easily available at Kiriana stores or grocery stores. We usually have to make sachets for because the usual dose is I think 250 milligram per kg. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. To... That is okay. Okay. So uh, I think any other question? Does immunotherapy or IVIG help in pericoviruses infections? So if you will ask an infectious diseases expert, they will say that it will help. So many severe infections, IVIG does help, but uh, I am not sure it is a protocol. Yeah, we have not used in IVIG in paracoviruses, we don't use. Any other comments by any other panelists? Most welcome, Dr. Naveen, Dr. Kavita. We have never used. I think that's the end of uh, the question answers. Thank you, uh, Dr. Prabhjot, for a very good talk. Uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Sajan, for uh, moderating the session. I think it's time uh, to call it a day. Any other final comments from anybody else? So, Sajan, sir? No, uh, I think uh, if one thing is uh, the you know uh, taking a detailed history and examination and Pointing and uh, you know, making your differential diagnosis and uh, uh, you know planning your investigations accordingly and having a uh, 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 you know as slightly these uh, supportive measures is the key and as you understand the pathology and pathophysiology down the line. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Prabhu, for a thank you, sir. wonderful session and uh, thank you, Gopit. Thanks everyone for an interactive session. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.